Our gospel for today comes from John chapter 14, verses 8 through 17. It's found on page 59 of your New Testament if you'd like to follow along. Hear the good news for this day. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the words themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. To be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. This is our good news for this day. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I saw this cartoon the other day and it always makes me laugh. You can't see it on the top. There's a person that says, who wants change? And everyone throws their hand in the air. And then he says, who wants the change? And everyone puts down their hand. And goes away. <laughs> we all want things to be different and not. We all want things to be better and not. We all want change as long as it doesn't require us to change. Well, the good news is, Change comes whether you like it or not, and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. Maybe that's not good news. Philip calls out to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And then Jesus smacks himself in the head. <laughs> Jesus has been trying to show them the Father the entire time. Not the Father as they think he is, but the Father as he actually is. And then Philip asks him to show him the Father. For all of their lives, these disciples have been told that God the Father will meet them maybe on a mountaintop, or maybe when they're good, or maybe when they understand things in the right way. But here they have been walking around with somebody that is part of God the Father. And they never once realize it. After Jesus gets done smacking himself in the head, he's about as short as he could possibly be with the disciples. How can you say, show us the Father, when, look, me, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But then maybe Jesus realizes that he's fighting a losing battle, and he goes to something a little simpler. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. He basically says, okay, Philip and Peter for that matter, and Judas and Paul eventually, you all don't get it. You don't get that God works differently than you imagine. You don't get the why or the how or the when, but at least look at the what. Look at the miracles in front of your face and see that God is truly active in your lives. And then the disciples say, huh? <laughs> we are living in an odd time, a rushed time, a changing time, a time that up until the 1800s, when you wanted to get somewhere fast, you got on a horse. Think about that. From Jesus' time to the 1800s, camel or horse, take your choice. Then we jump from horse to train, to 
to car to airplane within the course of 150 years. We've gone from papyrus to paper to television to the internet. Now, I don't think many of you come from the papyrus generation. <laughs> Do you remember rolling your paper from reeds? No. But there, there are some of you that are from what we call the print generation. Some from the television generation. And then some from the pesky internet generation that is slowly taking over and ruining things. Where before in churches you had similar groups of people that largely had their brains working the same way. Now we have all of you. We have three completely different generations of people all sitting in the same room together. And you all don't agree. Who wants change? Now who wants to change? But it comes whether we want it to or not. We're, li we're also living not just in a shift in generations, but a shift in understanding of what it means to be church, what it means to be religious. You've all seen the declining numbers about church attendance. And we pull our hair out, or at least I do, saying, where have all the believers gone? But we've uncovered an interesting detail in those numbers. In the past, Christianity was a more popular thing. In fact, it was the thing. For lack of a better word, it was the social club. It was the club where you went to do things. So before, when we thought about believers, we divided them into three groups. So you had your fervent believer, your person that desperately believed, that held on to God closely. And then you had your person that went with them because they were the social club. That was where you went to hang out. And then we had one person that was honest about not believing. Now in this generation, you have your fervent believer. But now you have somebody that admits that they went to church because it was a social gathering. But they didn't actually believe. And you still have your unbeliever. It's not that belief has decreased, it's more so that honesty has increased. And that people are finding they have lots and lots of other options of what they could do. People don't feel ashamed to admit that they don't believe. And then we look at this younger generation. This younger generation that we say is no longer going to church. But again, we're looking at the numbers wrong. It's not that younger people are no longer faithful. It's that faith looks different than we expect. Different than the God we've come to know as the only God. My God is the right God. I don't know what you're doing. The truth is that these young people, these kids today, are meeting God in ways that we could never imagine. When I was in youth group growing up, it was a social club. You went and you bowled. You did laser tag. You climbed the walls. And if you got to it, you read the Bible. It was a safe place for you to gather together and have a good time. Your parents knew what you were doing because you were surrounded by church kids. They've never been a pastor's kid, apparently, but that's not <laughs> When I was a youth leader, we still focused on a lot of fun elements, but it had a big action element of going out and doing, building something, feeding somebody. It had that part of making sure that you were connecting their faith with the real world. Still fellowship, but action oriented. But in talking to our youth recently, do you know what they want? Bible study. Can you believe that? Youth want to study together, learn together, know more of what it means to be Christians together. It doesn't mean they always just want to sit there in a room alone reading their Bible. But they want to actually engage the God that they've experienced. If there is one truth about our youth today, 
that we can say across the board wasn't necessarily the truth about youth in the past. It's that they're nonstop busy. There is always something for them to do. They have sports and classes and required volunteer hours. You heard that, right? They have music lessons and performances. They have dances and social gatherings and community events. They have options on top of options on top of options of how they can fill every single minute of every single day. Which has left a lot of them running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Chickens with no time for death. Which has caused them to come to me and come to Mike, our youth director, and say, we'd like to dig deeper into our faith. You might not want to sit in church on Sunday because Pastor Adrian's boring, but, well, they don't say that to me, but, uh, but they want to dig into their faith. Our last confirmation class, uh, the last confirmation class every year ends in the same way. We play a game of hot potato. Printed on a soccer ball are various hot button topics. Abortion, climate change, death penalty. You fear talking about it, it's on there. They throw the ball around and whoever drops it has to pick it back up and answer, say what they think about the first topic that they see. And then they pass the ball around and each person shares their feelings on it. And every time before we do this particular class, I think, this is a terrible idea. This is the worst idea that I've ever had, and we're going to do it again. I think they're not going to care. We're going to have short answers and then silence. And then we do it. And we talk. And talk. And talk. This last time, in an hour and a half, we only made it through three topics. And we even went over time. When we talk about kids today, we're almost always worried. But I'm not worried. Not from what I see. They have faith, just not faith in the way we would normally see it. Jesus concludes our reading with a promise. <clears throat> Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the work that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than me. Because I'm going to the Father. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is not lip service from Jesus, but an opportunity for us to follow along with all of the amazing things that God continues to do in the world today. We have an opportunity to do greater things than Jesus. Think about that. If any other person said that other than Jesus, it would be heresy. But here, Jesus says that. And it's because we step into the world to do what we have been called by God to do, and we do not do it alone. We don't only have Jesus at our back or God the Father at our back, but we also have the Spirit of God within us. All three. The problem is that when you get all three together, it gets messy. Because the Spirit of God, the Father, and the Son all want to use, make use of what you're good at. Help you to bring something special into this world. It's no longer the safe God that we imagine going to work, but the actual God that Jesus tells us about that wants us to get busy. The Spirit of God is working and active within you, within each and every one of you, calling you to a faith that works for you, calling you to a change that is needed for you, calling you to a need that only you can provide the solution. One thing I've learned over this last year, we can make a lot of assumptions about what you want. And we'll come and we'll say, here is what you want, and then you say, no, I want a Bible study. We don't know what you want until you let the Spirit speak through you. 
We don't know what you need until you let the Spirit of God out. We don't know what we can be as a congregation together until you embrace the Spirit that is dwelling within you and say the things that are on your heart. It's messy. It makes faith look not like how it's supposed to look. But it also happens to be the thing that changes the world. On this Confirmation Sunday, this Holy Spirit Sunday, we celebrate the things that God is still doing and the things that God calls us to do. Amen.